Hello and welcome back to OT the podcast. We're here to talk about watches, time, and how to spend it. I'm Andy Green. I'm the Felix Schultz. How you going, Felix? Pretty well, actually. Pretty well indeed. It's been a long day. Yeah, we've got a good one coming up, though. A very, very cool guest. Yeah. Uh, let's call him an OG of the of the watch world. Yeah, he, he was around. He'd been doing watches for decades since even when I started getting into it. So. He's been collecting watches since before I was born. Yeah, before watches were even invented, I suspect. Or before maybe, t- I don't know if you do. <laughs> That's a bit rude. Um, let's, let's not offend the lovely oh. man. So we have uh, James Dowling. Yes, otherwise known on the internet as... Mr. Rolex. We've spoken about him before, but uh, our fanboy crushes clearly are reaching their peaks tonight, and we're going to have a little chat to him. The people have spoken, and uh, we'll have him on very shortly. Now, James is a, is a guy who... I'm going to call him an authority on watches. I'm sure I you think agree. So. Yeah, uh, he loves quirk. He does. He loves quartz. Yep. He doesn't like playing the mainstream. Well, you know, he's been in it long enough to know that it is a game. Mm. And you know what? He, what else he loves? Teaching the young bucks of Instagram a lesson or two. Oh, we need people like this. He's our mm. our elder statesman. Now, I'm not quite sure how to describe him beyond sort of international watch authority slash no, expert. But I, I think well, maybe we'll let him do that himself. Yeah. Yeah. But a before, gent, a true gent of the watch industry. Now, before we get James on the phone, we've got something to talk about. We have to take a quick break. Today's episode is brought to you by Swiss typefaces who helped make it possible. Have you ever wondered what the city of Stockholm, Google Android and David Beckham's football team into Miami have in common with OT the podcast? Felix, it keeps me up at night. <laughs> well, we all use fonts from Swiss typefaces. When we were building the visual identity for OT, we knew that the right typeface was going to be very important because they're everywhere, especially if you're in digital, which everyone is. But typefaces are often overlooked and that's why there's so much yucky comic sans out there in the world. Yuck. Uh, So we knew we wanted something cool and something a little bit more custom, which is exactly what Swiss typefaces were able to offer. We ended up with Euclid, which we liked for its strong geometry and graphic feel. It's on our logo, it's on our socials. It's a big part of the brand. Though we nearly, very nearly, went with some of the cool, wild, experimental fonts from their lab section. So if you're looking to build a brand or refresh your existing one, don't overlook the typeface and check out SwissTypefaces.com. And welcome back. Now we've got time for a little bit of a section we like to call Things We've Liked. Well, should I kick this off? I think you've got a really good, appropriate one, so I think you should. Yeah, super relevant for this week, Felix. It is the Vintage Rolex Field Guide. A survival manual for the adventure that is vintage Rolex. <laughs> what a tagline. Now, this is the uh, Chevalier edition. Which Chevalier. Is Chevalier. Chevalier. I think it's knight. I think it means knight in French. Yeah, it's Something nobly, like nobly vibe, man. Uh, and it's uh, by a guy who goes by the pseudonym of Morning Tundra. Morning Tundra. Whatever that means. I don't. I think for uh, reasons. He's like dentists on TV. They can't show their face. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll link this all up, of course, and and link up to the Morning Tundra's IG as well. But it's basically a 300-page guide to navigating vintage Rolex. And it covers thousands of references, everything from models to movements to hang tags to guarantees, even to booklets. Who is this for? I actually think it's for everyone. I think it's for the guys getting into it. Would my mum like it? No. If if you're a watch person, (laughs) it's for you. Uh, and it's like the the level of detail and, and, and like stat-based info is really interesting as well, like data-based info. It's got like movement references that cover like the base, the caliber, what period that was made, mm. any like descriptions that would be on the movement, how many jewels, like what engravings it has, where they should be. Like it's super detailed. So so if I'm in the market for like buying, dropping proper money on a vintage Rolex, this is something I should maybe be getting across before I... Definitely. Like it's 45 bucks or something mm. on Amazon, uh, US dollars maybe, and we'll link up that as well. But yeah, I think that it's it's super handy. And what I really love is like the rational and logical approach to just explaining the world of vintage Rolex. Mm. Um, covers a lot of questions and certainly lessons that I've learned along the way with my sort of journey. Journey. Yeah, you know, journey. Journey. And, you know, it talks about simple things like the difference between value and price. Mm-hmm. And, you know, what factors you should consider when buying it. Um yeah, like I said, for the money, it's it's really, really uh, like a good buy. Mm-hmm. I've grabbed the preface, which I hope you don't mind me quickly reading, but I think it sums up nicely sort of what it's all about. Can you, on my, my one request, can yeah. you read it in like movie trailer voice? <laughs> I'll do my best. In a world. So here's, the, here's, here's part of the preface. 
This guide is for collectors of pre-owned and vintage Rolex watches. It is a reference manual and indeed, indeed to be, uh, intended sorry, to be concise, factual and data orientated. It was written for the purpose of purchasing watches rather than a celebration of their beauty or history. The book aims to summarize the product lines and references while highlighting the essential nuances important to watch collectors. Many of these subtle details are of little interest to the casual modern Rolex customer, but crucial to the vintage Rolex buyer. So I think that really... That tells you what it is. It tells you what it is. I haven't gotten through it all, but I've given it like a really good skim through and sort of picked out bits and pieces, mm. images, and it's it's more data than like a, a you know coffee table book. Can I tell you what it, it sounds like to me? It sounds like the distillation mm. of vintage Rolex forum in a convenient 300 word, mm. uh, you know, three how many pages book with them without all the politics and crap included. Yeah, well, I'll tell you when I, yeah. uh, like, it came in handy recently. I bought a, a vintage Tudor a couple of months ago, mm. sent it off to uh, my watchmaker to get it serviced. Turned out I kind of wanted a new crystal for it. So working out which crystal oh, yeah, handy. would fit and, like, finding the exact reference of the crystal that is right for the watch was getting really hard. So what other crystals would fit that watch? So it's one of those things where you can kind of pick it up and look and work out. It's like a, yeah, a ref- you might only pick it up when it, as needed. It's sort of like the information that, like, a you know a watchmaker who used to work for Rolex might have merged with you know forum information. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. sort of this amalgamation of sort of Useful. everything. Yeah. What about you, Felix? A little bit different. Yeah. <laughs> I've gone with an Instagram account. I'm just gonna um, pick it up and and see. This is go with me here. Mm-hmm. It's a company that makes art pastels. Okay. Uh, it is called. <clears throat> La Maison du Pastel. Um, they have been making pastels since 1720, and they've been making Henri Rouge pastels since 1880. So they are the uh, high-end uh, Vacheron Constant equivalent of the art pastel world. Like we're talking the pastels that you like painting or paint or, or drawing. Drawing, yes, or drawing pastels. And just it, it is absolutely so. I like it on a few levels. One, I find it very calming. Just look how beautiful that Instagram is. Oh wow, the colours on point. It's very. It's just so. Uh, you know, it's really tactile. Like they're these beautiful products that have. You know, they look really cool. They're super expensive, by the way. Like um, what's a what's a pack of pastels? Uh, over a hundred. Oh, <laughs> for like. Six or twelve. Okay. Um, so ones to keep away from the young children. Uh, yeah, not for not for you know your, your your creative table. Or if you really want to flex on the other school parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's really the other thing I find really interesting. It's that sort of the values of old world luxury. Like mm. I find things like Hermes and you know LV, like the, those how they make their stuff really interesting because it's those the values of craftsmanship and uh, all that sort of stuff, but in a really different yet related world. So I just find it really interesting. So this is what like a young Marie Antoinette used to scribble with. Yeah. <laughs> like Legit though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, oh no, no, you're yeah. right. Um, so that's, look, um, and I knew you, you were going hard with the, the the Rolex thing, so I didn't want to compete with that, but mm. it's just nice. You might f- The stories are cool, like they go behind the scenes and, you know, it's sort of like old factories and how they make things. I find it, you know, really interesting. Have we, have we ever seen like a pastel dial? On a watch? That's a really good question. I don't think so. It'd be an interesting texture. Fortis did one a while ago that was like a chalkboard. Okay. Uh, it was close. Great. Yeah, so, I don't know, chalk pastel. Is chalk a pastel? Who knows? It's not for us to answer anyway. Is it not a stone? Do you know who might know? James Dowling. <laughs> he probably would. <laughs> yeah. Like legitimately. <laughs> Let's really throw him and lead with that question. What do you know about pastels? <laughs> well, speaking of... I feel like we should give him a call. Yeah, let's wrap this up. All right. Hello, can you hear us, James? Yeah, you're a bit crackly, but other than that, you're fine. Uh, today, we've got the lovely and the incomparable James Dowling, who is uh, a preeminent figure in the watch world. I think he's one of the, you know, as his Instagram handle says, he's one of the guys who knows all about Rolex. Mr. Rolex, welcome on the podcast. No, I mean, the reason that I like Rolex and that I collect Rolex and that I've studied it for a long time is that nobody knows everything. Um, they are, I believe Churchill once described the Kremlin as a, a mystery wrapped in a riddle wrapped in an enigma. So um, 
Are you saying that Rolex is like the Kremlin? (laughs) (laughs) Prove that they're not. Um, No, no, not at all. Rolex is not like the Kremlin, not like the KGB, not like the CIA. (laughs) All of the above take lessons from Rolex and have a keep secret. (laughs) Um, I I don't think this podcast uh, is ever going to make it to air. It's going to mysteriously disappear. (laughs) 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 It's all away, yeah. (laughs) Um, James, I just want to sort of get into uh, where you sort of started off and how your, your interest in watches started. But I've got one quick question before we go there. You've said that not everyone knows everything about Rolex. I think there's a lot of people on the internet that do think they know everything about Rolex. There are. The the problem with the internet is that it has, it's established this group of people who, who've read what other people on the internet have said. Yeah. And because they've read what 25 or 30 other people on the internet have said, they then come to the almost always erroneous conclusion that putting all of this together makes them an expert on anything. And it doesn't matter. It's not just Rolex. There's all sorts of things that uh, people who've never done any genuine research, you know, they literally, they they consider that because they're Google masters, they've done a 50, they've done a 15 minute course on how to use Google, how to use parenthetical searches and things like that. Consider themselves to be an expert. Um, I don't consider myself to be an expert, but when I wrote my um, book on Rolex, it involved me spending several days at the Federal Patent Library in Switzerland, um, hiring an interpreter. It involved spending days at the uh, patent office in London, because Rolex was originally an English company. Uh, It involved spending time at Companies House, which is where all companies in Britain are registered, getting back all the details of um, all the directors of Rolex going back over the years, their, their home addresses, everything. You need that information. Maybe five percent of it made its way into the book, but it's the foundation on which the research mm-hmm. comes. And what bothers me is a lot of people just say, say stuff without ever really doing research. And you know, there are a number of people who whose research I do respect and who um, are in fact, much more forensic in, in detail than I am. Mm. And, yeah, th- those people I do consider to be experts, but, but the vast majority of experts are people for whom um, they, they should be wearing a T-shirt which have air quotes on it. <laughs> anyway, end of, end of, so I, 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 you know, I like to start off by, uh, you know, by insulting the vast majority of people who, who were listening. No, no, so no, that does let's, well. let's carry on in that vein. Yep, yeah, let's go. So you've been <laughs> collecting and researching watches for a very long time, and I'm keen to hear how long exactly you have been sort of in the watch game, but also keen to hear how it's changed over, you know, the decades that you've been involved. I really wasn't a watch fan um, mm-hmm. for a long time. Um, I started, when I met my wife, I was, I, okay, we've got to back up a bit. That's I right. believe that there is such a thing as as a collector gene. People either are collectors or they aren't. Sure. And if you're a collector, you will always collect. You will have collected comic books when you were a kid or cigarette cards or something or other. You will always have, want, have, have liked, and you will be a completist. You will want to get all of them. So when, when I, I met my wife 37 years ago, mm. I didn't collect watches. I collected cars. And when she met me, I had 16 cars. Um, <laughs> Love that. At that time, I had, lots of, I had lots of cars which are now considered to be you know, wonderful classic. But at that time, they were old cars. And I collected them because, A, they were nice. I liked them aesthetically. But, B, they were quite inexpensive. Mm. And it was a way of having a toy without breaking the bank. Mm. The, the irony is that at that time, I really, I wasn't into collecting watches. Um, to me, watches were just another tool. And so I owned just two watches. Mm-hmm. I owned a, a GMT Master, a Rolex GMT Master, and a Cartier Tank. Oh, and I think now... If I had to say to anybody, if somebody said to me, what are the only two watches in the world that I should own? I would probably say, get yourself a GMT Master and a tank. You can't really go wrong. Absolutely. Does it all. Yeah. What, what car did you used to own that 
uh, you've sold that you regret? Okay, the, the thing that, I, uh, the one that I'm most disappointed with was I had a 280 SL Pagoda. Oh, hello. The, uh, yeah. Um, and I spent almost two years having it restored. Mm-hmm. Roger Edwards did the engine, the body was completely redone. Um, I had it, it, it was pristine. And 10 days after I got it back, it was stolen out of my driveway. Oh, shit. Um, n- and never found again. That, that's that's the one that got away that I really resent. The rest of them, mostly I don't regret in any way because m- most of the time, like with the watches that have gone, mm. I've traded them for other things that I wanted even more. So, you know, you don't really regret something that you've got something better in mm. exchange for it. So I try not to do regrets. It's a, mm. it's a bad habit then. I was wondering, James, given your sort of uh, thoughts around the genetic collector, are you a collector? Am I a collector? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, okay. I because I'm I not. I, I agree with you completely, yeah. and I'm not. Not wouldn't call yeah. myself a collector at all. Yeah. No. 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 I mean, I I, have, I collect Magra tape recorders. I collect Curtis calculators. I collect Leica M series cameras. Cool. You know, I, I like fine machinery. I like yeah. nice. I like toys. You know. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. James. So, has vintage Rolex collecting gone too deep, in your opinion? Then, um, you know, different mark dials and bezel inserts, and calling you know cracked dials a rare, unusual spider a dial, spider web, all that, yeah, whatever those things are. Okay, I can argue both sides of the mm-hmm. coin. There, you can say that um, if if a tropical dial, which is a dial that has been damaged by sunlight or UV or whatever mm. it is a rare and desirable thing, then why isn't the spider dial, which is the dial which has been damaged by um, incorrect application of the clear lacquer? Um, we look at the uh, 16550 Explorer 2 yep, yep. uh, with the cream dials, which started out white and mm. then changed to, uh, to cream. And the cream dials are more desirable because... Uh, Again, it's it's a defect in the dial. So the the bigger question you have to ask is: Are defects desirable? As to whether or not the whole thing about um, mark so and so bezel and mark so and so dial this is this is a huge area in which I believe that there is the prime logic behind this, these classifications is people wanting to say something is rarer than something else and thereby yeah. charge more money for it. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right there. I also think it's a little bit of a sort of a situation where you've lost sight of the, the forest for the trees. Like, it's a lovely watch yeah. and, and maybe it doesn't all add up to, you know, on paper or, you know, specifications, numbers, what it should have out of the factory for whatever reason, but does that make it any less of a watch? One of the big problems in vintage Rolex collecting is that almost everybody who owns a vintage Rolex watch is not the original owner. Mm. They, it, it's been through several hands before they they have it, and there is the history of the watch is that somebody bought it as a new watch and wore it as a new watch and cherished it and loved it, and probably because they cherished and loved it, sent it at regular intervals mm. back to their Rolex dealer or to Rolex themselves to have it serviced. And Rolex having the sort of philosophy that they do, if they were changing parts on it, would would put in brand new parts which are identical to the parts on the newest model. Yeah. So you often get watches in which the particularly things like sport watches where the bezel and the bezel insert are replaceable, where the the case the dial, the hands, and the bezel are all from different eras. Not because the watch is a bastard, but simply because that's how Rolex deal with, uh, as far as they're concerned, they're doing you a favor. They're yeah, bringing the watch it. up to today's spec. Yeah, correct. Um, so, and people look on this, oh, it's a, you know, it's a mismatch, it's a, it's a bastard, it's a bits of this, bits of that. No. Um, but in fact, that's evidence of the watch having been properly cared for. Which is what you want. <laughs> you would think. <laughs> you would think. Okay, so, James, of all the Rolex models, and I know you, you've got an extensive collection, but I want to know what your favourite reference 
Rolex is and why? Um, the, the Rolex I find myself wearing most often is uh, a Rolex Oyster Quartz okay. day date. You're a big fan of the Oyster Quartz. Um, a huge fan of the Oyster Quartz. I think it, it arguably is the, one of the best movements that Rolex ever made. It's the only movement that Rolex ever made with Geneva stripes. Mm. <laughs> it's an all-metal movement. It, it is a great movement. Uh, hugely accurate. It's loud as the marim- marimba section in a Brazilian band, but the other band, the uh, the wristband on it, particularly on the seventeen hundred, the uh, simple date just voice of course, is probably the strongest band that Rolex ever made. Mm. There are two things I like about it. One is that it, it's inherently accurate, but two is it doesn't look like every, what everybody thinks a Rolex looks like. Yeah. And so I'm able to wear it without attracting too much comment. Yeah, well, it's a great watch. What do you think the most important Rolex reference is? The most important, probably for the history of the company, is the ladies' two-tone date dress, <laughs> yes. which is the watch they watch they sell the most of. It is everything that uh, a Rolex should be, and it's the ultimate everyday watch for a woman. Yeah, and I. Uh, I would say for men, the ultimate man's Rolex is a steel date just with a white gold bezel. They are every, they're the classic piece. I know everybody focuses on sport watches, um, but those two watches are every, are where Rolex put all their efforts because mm-hmm. they're the biggest sellers. And they are, in most people's minds, what a Rolex looks like. You know, so. the watch nerds, think about sport watches yeah. that's what we think of as, as as a Rolex but they represent probably 10 or 15 percent of the most of their production most of their production is date just and that's that's where Rolex put all its effort and mm-hmm. uh, they're the watch that defined them that's that's really you know, interesting just has been going since 45 now so we're looking at uh, we're looking at 75 years old now they've got it down uh, down to a t it's interesting that you say the ladies two-tone yeah. day just because we had a guest on a couple of weeks ago and sort of her first real watch uh was two-tone date just with a uh with the pink dial and diamond markers in i think 31 we we said it was 33 31 yeah. uh and it's just yeah. lovely and it's like for her not being a watch collector or really into yeah. it beyond a, a luxury sort of Treat it's, for a it's, milestone. It's, it was perfect. It's a classic first watch for for a woman. It's either the, the Rolex Datejust or a Cartier. So, yeah, uh, I 100% agree with that. And I think that's a really good point about people focusing on models that, that aren't really the most important ones. Like, like you said, all those steel models, it's sort of the what seems to take up so much oxygen but really is, you know, the least important pieces from a, from a business or commercial standpoint. On that, yeah, I mean, they're the iceberg. They're the tip of the iceberg mm. that's above the water. The, the 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 stuff that's below the water, people don't see and don't acknowledge. But they are they're they're what made Rolex, and they're what keep Rolex in business. Mm. And and I was just sort of wondering if you had a thought, like obviously, you know, the Nautilus and the Daytonas and all the there's you know big supply issues. I think at the moment. What's your thought on on that situation now? Like from a from a longer perspective, is it is it common? Is it unusual? Or wh- where do you stand on it? I'm a contrarian, and <laughs> I have all I've said something for for several years now, which gets me pretty much excommunicated from the International Society of Watch Collectors, which is that to a very large extent, watches are a subset of the fashion industry. And the essence of fashion is that it's ephemeral, that it changes. Mm -hmm. And I have been in collecting watches and buying and selling them long enough to have seen trends come and trends go. When I was getting setting up in this industry or whatever we want to call it, the hottest things were bubble backs and Rolex printers. Mm. That's where the big money was. Things like Daytona's were half the price of a bubble back. I bought my first Nautilus um, 25, 28 years ago, Mm -hmm. and I was able to get a 10% discount. Beautiful. Because it wasn't wasn't a watch they could sell. 
Yeah, hundred percent. And when I, when you know, when I was just starting to get interested in watches at that sort of level, Frank Mueller was the hottest thing on the block, and you know they were commanding massive prices, and everyone wanted the the master banker. Which which sort of leads me is there who's been doing well in that sort of long term trend? Who's being either ahead of it or keeping on top of it from a brand side point of view? The brand that's done the best out of it is Rolex because they completely and absolutely ignore it. Mm. Do they? Yeah. Do they ignore it? I reckon they, or do they set it? Um, no, I think they make a conscious decision. See, Rolex, what, what most people don't understand about Rolex is that essentially they have this giant catalogue and they have three movements. Hmm. Well, they're four movements, if we, if we include Skydweller. But they have the, the gents, they just movement, which you add uh, another module and becomes the day date. Mm -hmm. They have the ladies date just movement. They have the Daytona movement and they have the Skydweller movement. Mm -hmm. And between them, everything has those four movements. So their watches are all variations on a theme. Mm. So, you know, the Yacht, the Yacht Master is, is a variation on the Daytona. Wow. Um, one of the most interesting things to me, and that I've never been able to get an answer on, is that the Daytona has screw down pushers and the Yacht Master doesn't. And yet the Yacht Master has the same depth rating as a Daytona. Huh. We don't have the answer. No, no, I don't have the answer <laughs> yeah. to that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fascinating. But, but outside of Rolex, I mean, I think my answer, um, you know, not to, is I think that Amiga have done very, very well since, you know, the, the early 2000s or the late 90s. I think their sort of trajectory has been very interesting to watch. Omega have had the great advantage and or disadvantage of not actually making a watch that anybody wants. Is that the Speedmaster? Let's put the Speedmaster to one side, which is a watch they've been making now for 60-something years. Yeah. Essentially, you look at Omega, and they are they're the mirror image of Rolex. They're a publicly traded company, so they're always trying to get their numbers up uh -huh. so as to keep the stock market happy. Hmm. Rolex are owned by a trust, and think in long term. Look, look at the way that Omega have dealt with the Speedmaster and the way that Rolex have dealt with the Daytona. The Speedmaster is a little older than the Daytona, mm -hmm. yet as far as I know, Rolex had never, ever issued a special edition of the Daytona. No. Um, Not beyond sort of engraving for the... For the actual Daytona race, The Daytona right? 500, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, that's not a special edition. It's not anything you can go out and buy. No. Um, what about and, the uh, uh, Omani dial, would you call that? Or the precious, <laughs> the semi-precious stones or something. That's as close as you get. Again, you, you can't buy it. Mm. Uh, well, well the thing, things like the uh, the Parve dial watches and the rainbow Daytonas and things of that nature are catalogue watches, but I wouldn't class them as special editions, whereas Omega seems to put out a, a, a special edition. You know, they're, they're in a war to the death with Hublot as to who can put out more special editions. That's, uh, that's, that's a good statement to make. Uh. It's a very hot take. <laughs> what I want to switch, switch gears, I want to ask you, uh, with your sort of extensive and long knowledge of Rolex, what's the quirkiest thing or things that you think that they've done along the way? Because... Look, they're not impervious to making a, a funky decision here and there, but I remember the old women, you know, you know, the old Tiger dial or the, the Harley Davidson one, whatever that was, or even nearly doing like a whole bunch of quartz watches. So I'm just keen to hear what you think the the, the quirkiest or the weirdest thing that they've done along the way is. Oh, I, I mean, to to my mind, the most bizarre watch they ever made was the Leopard Daytona. Mm. Classic. Um, it was almost as if somebody said, how far out can we go? <laughs> and um, somebody came up with something really outre and said, no, 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 no. Much, much, much crazier than that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, really crazy. And so they went back again and came back with something that, you know, grown men would weep when they saw it. And they said, no, 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 you're on the right track, but just keep going, guys. just keep pushing and um, and they produced a watch which really was genuinely bizarre. I mean, I, 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 I've never been able to find out the logic behind the making of that watch. Maybe that's their version of, like, the troll. Maybe they were just ahead of their time. 
When was uh, do you know yeah. when that was released? When did that first come out? Yeah, it was released when the very first automatic Daytonas oh. were released. It was um, Four? something of that ilk. Yeah. They released it at the same time as they released the Daytona Beach watches, mm. which were the uh, four different colored stone dials. And they were those were meant as a, a lady version of the Daytona. Yeah. And in fact, I always thought of them really as more the sort of Mediterranean gigolos watch to be worn <laughs> with a... With a, a, a big yellow gold chain around your neck and your shirt open I, to the I wasn't big, button above your belly button. Yeah, uh, yeah my, my comment around the, the Leopard Day time was, I wonder how popular Versace was at the time mm. that watch was in development. Because maybe there's a, a correlation as to, you know, like you say, watches are following fashion. Maybe they were looking at where, you know, what was on, you know, fashionable on the runways and they were translating that to the wrist. Yes, but I'm sorry, but the idea of... Rolex looking at somebody like Versace, mm. uh, you know, the whole Miami Vice look sort of thing. It's like a member of the Seventh day Adventist deciding to take LSD. It's it just. <laughs> It's just so you can't really contemplate. Yeah, it's 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 a wacky watch. I think now with uh, with Tiger King on Netflix, it's probably a little bit popular. But it, it, the the, the letter Daytona has been popular now for a few years because mm. a it's not made anymore, and b it is just so outre. And what um, ab- on, and on funky and bizarre uh, watches? What about the dials that Rolex have produced? I know that it's almost an endless list on on the day dates, at least of you know dinosaur or. Media or <laughs> ammonite, solar yeah. light, baker light. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, they, they've, uh, it's the one area in which uh, fashion is allowed to run rampant here at Rolex is, is on the dials and the bezels. And to me, one of the most interesting things about having, about visiting Rolex, and I visited their factory several times, is at the, atop the dial factory yeah. is their jewel setting department. It's on the top floor. What I found amazing about it is that downstairs there are these giant machines, um, giant PVD machines and all sorts of things which churn out the dials. Upstairs, literally, you could take a jeweler from the 18th century, sit him down there, and he would recognize everything. Amazing. Um, they, the, the tools they use, the fact they have to make the tools themselves as part of their training. Cool. It, it, it's all just like it was 50 years, 100 years, 150 years, 200 years ago. It's amazing to think that you look at one of those rainbow Daytonas and to realize that that bezel was completely set by hand. Mm. It's not, there is no machinery involved whatsoever in that, other than in the making of the bezel, in the actual physical metal bezel. The rest of it is all done by hand, by skilled eyes. And and it's not a big department. There's less than a dozen people in there. It's quite amazing that they also look so consistent. Yes. Yep. Rolex have the ability, because of the depth of their wallets, to be able to get the best of everything. And one of the big jobs there um, is that, you know, I saw all the diamonds coming in. Um, the, the, one of the biggest jobs is sorting them, mm. is matching them. It's really interesting. The only machine they have there is a uh, is a giant turntable with lasers and what have you. And when they, for, for example, the ladies' two-tone dial with little diamonds on the watches, those diamonds are tiny, they're like a tenth of a carat. Matching those is just a pain in the ass. So they actually have a machine that does that. Mm. And it sorts them. So that you will get, I think it's 10, there's 10 on a, on a dial, so you will get 10 that are identical. You may get six dials which look identical, but in fact, if you look at the diamonds, there will be slight differences, but all the diamonds on each dial will be identical. And you go to the next dial, which will look slightly different from that dial before, but all the diamonds will be identical because they, they've been sorted perfectly. And I remember when they launched uh, an amazing GMT Master with uh, an emerald bezel. And they told me um, that it was limited not by the number, you know, not a limited number. They weren't going to make 50 or they weren't going to make 25. They were going to make as many as they could find identically matching emeralds. I think it was something like they made 30 watches or something. Wow. Um, 
just because it, the, the question was just matching those perfect emeralds. So you were saying that this, that, that's such a, a hands-on department there is the stone setting. Is it all stones? Like even if it's like the you know the ladies' day just with the, the ten stones, is that all done by hand up there too? No, I believe that those are machine set. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That was because I, I was thinking, well, that's an incredible sort of volume for you know uh, because I imagine that's quite a lot of watches a week. No, I, I'm talking about the the, uh, the the serious gem set watches. Mm. Yeah. Cool. So we've been talking uh, a bit about Daytona's now. And, we recently interviewed uh, James Cox to hear his story of, you know, the Paul Newman Daytona, uh, which, you know, was famously sold in 2017. And we got Felix and I talking about crazy, you know, watch ownership stories, uh, sometimes serendipitous even. And we want to hear your kind of wildest story, maybe, you know, of your own ownership. I don't think I've got any. Um, <laughs> There's got to be something. You've got to have something where you, you picked it up. Uh, or have you, you Have you picked up? Uh, you bought a car, it was in the glove box. You bought it with cash um, under a bridge. The weirdest thing that happened to me was that 28 years ago, maybe, no, no, 25 years ago, I was emailing a guy in Finland who had, who knew of a watch that was phenomenal. Mm-hmm. It was a 6236, the triple calendar chronograph. It had been owned by one family. It mm-hmm. had always been serviced by this retailer who were, the, at that time, the only Rolex retailer in Finland, in Helsinki. The family wanted to sell the watch, and they'd approached the retailer, who um, who I knew, knew the retailer. So he contacted me, and I got on a plane and flew to Finland, went to the store, saw the watch. The watch was phenomenal. It was in perfect condition. It had everything, every single piece of paper. And not only that, but because the retailer had always serviced the watch, I got the service records for the watch. I got everything for the watch. It it was an absolute phenomenal piece. So we then decided that we'd go out to lunch to celebrate this, you know, which was at that time was a a phenomenally uh, expensive purchase for me. Mm -hmm. And as we're going out, the guy who owned the store said to me, "Um, oh, do you think you might be interested in this? And picks up what looks like one of those pilot flight cases, you mm-hmm. know, the, the big sort of rectangular boxes. And this so this one was in green and had uh, metal corners on it. And the metal corners were corroding badly. And the clasps on it were corroding badly. And I looked at it and I, what is it? And he opened it. And when you op- when he opened it, the first thing you saw was this giant hammerite metal box in Rolex green, Ooh. and on it was a huge Rolex crest okay. with a coronet and, and uh, the word Rolex. Uh, and this thing had been closed so long that the imprint of the word Rolex and the coronet was was embossed into the top of the box, into the into the sort of satin lining of the box. He then pulled out the front of the box, which opened in a sort of concertina way, and in there were four box four <laughs> little boxes, each marked A, B and C, mm-hmm. A, B, C, D. He pulled one of them out and in it were ten holders for thirty five millimeter slides. Yeah. And he took out one of the slides, and it was the entire Rolex collection for 1958. No way. Every, all the slides, all the 35 millimeter slides, and a catalog with all the X Factor prices. Okay. So I, I just was amazed by it. I thought, wow, this is... And it turned out that they'd, um, it had belonged to the Rolex agents who covered all of Scandinavia in the 50s. Because at that time, there were... Uh, customs control between Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Denmark, it was a pain in the ass for him to have to take watches. Yeah. So they, they made this up for him to be able to go between the countries, to drive between the countries, without having to always be carrying watches. But it had everything. That's really um, cool. What was amazing was that it had in there the uh, photographs and the price list for the uh, for the star dial moon phase 6062 oyster yeah. 
And what was amazing was that that watch at that time was 10% cheaper than a day date. I think you've just, I, I do need to correct you on one factual error with that story, James. Yeah. You, uh, you said that the box was corroded. We, uh, we like to call that patina. <laughs> But what a story. That no, is awesome. It's no, no, you see, this, this is your problem. You see, you're not a dealer. <laughs> you see, you have to understand that the mark of a dealer is, is not just the fact that they will have two loops. They have a buying loop and a selling loop. Mm. The, the buying loop is probably eight power, and the selling loop is one and a half power, and, it, and it's got a lot of sweat on the lens. So, yeah. <laughs> Vaseline. But the use of language is equally important. So mm. when you're buying something, it's corroded. When you're selling it, it's pastilla. <gasps> you know, that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. That's a very true indeed. That's a pretty cool story. That is good. It's the 1950s version of a, an iPad with uh, the software on it. So it's 58. So yeah. that would have been... Was, yeah. there, was there Submariners in that at that point? There would have been... Yeah. There was one Submariner, and this is where it gets really interesting. One of the things that makes it really interesting mm. is the they listed the Submariner as 6536 slash 5508. Uh-huh. In other words, you, you would have got whichever one they decided to give you. Well, yeah, They sure. didn't give a shit. <laughs> which, which comes back to that thing of, you know, people geeking out over having everything exactly correct. I don't think it you know, yeah. translated to the sales reality in the 50s. One of the people who helped me massively in in the uh, in in writing my first book was a guy called John Reed, who used to be managing director of Rolex Japan in the sixties and seventies, cool. and before that he he was a, he was a, a trained watchmaker. He had worked at Rolex Geneva um, and knew Wilsdorf very well, and because he was one of the few English people who worked there, Wilsdorf and he became great friends. Um, and he used to invite him round for tea. So he knew Wilson very well. Mm. And one of the things he always told me was, um, I often saw the 5512s and 5513s with the wrong backs. You know, you get a 5512 with a 5513 back and vice mm. versa. Mm. And I said, you know, what's the story behind all that? And he said, it was very simple. He said, it, 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 up until the 60s and the 70s, the job was, Move, get the metal out the door. Just sell product. Get the stuff. You know, Rolex then isn't Rolex now. Mm-hmm. Rolex now is is more organised than anything you can you've ever encountered. It's it, it's the epitome of Swiss organisation, precision, all of that. No argument. But in the fifties, it was a middle sized company. Mm-hmm. And was, it wasn't living hand to mouth. It wasn't worth millions and millions and millions. It was a it was a company that was doing pretty well. It was a mid sized family owned business that was doing okay. It had it had it real competitors. Kind of, yeah, it was somewhere between Bremont and Hublot in you know as a sort of a, it, it, its importance in yeah, in, right. in in nowadays in, in in terms of what what you think of a, of a watch firm nowadays, and they. The, the thing that made them different was that they were Wilson was really good at publicity, so he got the name out there a lot. But truthfully, most people would have sooner had a Launchies or an Omega than a Rolex in the fifties. And so the thing that they were determined was get them get the stuff out the door. And so if they had an order for two hundred and fifty five five one three Submariners and they only had 180, then they would whack 5513 dials on 5512s and get them out the door. Do you think that the Rolex we know today would exist if, you know, Hans Wolof had left, uh, you know, heirs and it had continued to be run as a for-profit or a family-run business to this day? Or what what would that situation look like for Rolex now? I I don't think Rolex would have changed... um, because before he, I mean, he set up the foundation in, in 45. And so it, it was 15 years before he died that he had time to set the structure up so mm. that it, it, would, it would go on. The the only change would be that if, if for whatever reason, Rolex became a public company, mm. then it would, have, it would have different targets. It would think differently. It's brought, I think the first time I went to, the, when they rebuilt the factories, they went from 27 factories to four over a 15-year period. And they were 
that really was, that, that's when everything really changed. After that, they are very organized, very precise, everything. And I remember being my first visit to the big factory at Acacius where they were, where the assembly is done. The building is it, it, just a giant rectangle. There's no other way to describe it. it, it it's, a, it's a slab-sided rectangle. Each side there's a, a corridor up the middle, and then there are workshops on either side of the corridor with lots and lots of glass, so people work under natural light mm. most of the time. And the thing that amazed me when I was walking down the corridor was just how wide the corridor was. I'm not sure of the exact dimensions, but let's assume that the, the ateliers were 20 meters wide each side, but the corridor was like 40 meters wide. Hmm. And I just, I couldn't work. It, it, it just struck me as the most ridiculous waste of space. And I, I asked Dominique, who was the head of uh, PR at that time, I said, why are the corridors so wide? And she said, we looked at the biggest machine that we had in the building, and we decided to make the corridors hmm. twice as big as that machine, so that when we want, if we have to expand and we need to get that machine in, we can get it down the corridors. Mm, clever. Their thinking was, it wasn't just the next quarter, it wasn't the next year or so, it was 10, 25 years in advance. Yeah, smart. And, and that's the freedom of not being a publicly traded company that they have. And it's not just not being publicly traded. Uh, I mean, for example, Brightling, who are owned by a venture capital company, have, you know, consistent pressures on them. They can't take that sort of long-term 5, 15, 25-year view that Rolex can. Rolex and Patek and Odemar are probably the only firms that have the resources in depth and the ownership structure that they can take incredible long-term views. And it isn't a coincidence that those three companies are the companies that make the watches which are hardest to buy right now. Yeah, interesting. Because if, if put it this way, if either of those three companies were publicly traded, they would be making as many Daytonas, Nautiluses, Royal Oaks as the market would bear. If you're publicly traded, you have a duty to your shareholders. I think that's uh, very, very true. So, which leads, I think, nicely to a collection, uh, to a question rather, is the Nautilus worth it? Did you do Dubai Watch Week last year? I wasn't able to, sadly. Um, okay, uh, I, I was on a panel there, and um, th they were talking about the grey market, and I said, look, I, I'm sorry, but I think the grey market is a pejorative term which the manufacturers have brought in so as to make it seem less than ethical. You know, like it, it's just one step between below the black market. No, no, no. I said the real term is the free market. The actual... The, the value, the list price of a Nautilus may be £25,000, but the street price is £50,000. Mm -hmm. That's the free That's the free market price. That is what people are prepared to pay for it. I guess that's a conversation of value versus price though, right? Yeah, very much so. Okay. What about, uh, you, I'm sure you've owned many Daytonas in your lifetime. Uh, is the Rolex yeah. Daytona all that lives up to be? The Royal Estate Holder is, is a really interesting watch. Um, I've owned many. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I never tire of telling the story of when I bought my GMT Master, long before I knew anything about Rolex, is I went to the store, picked the GMT Master, asked for a discount, mm -hmm. and was told in a very supercilious tone, I'm sorry, sir, we don't discount Rolex. Except, of course, if you want one of these Daytonas, we can give you 20% off. <laughs> one of the other things about buying and selling Daytonas, 15 years ago, the Daytona was the watch that I was able to buy most often mm. new old stock. Mm. But literally, people would buy a Daytona and they'd wear it for a few days and get annoyed with it, put it back in the box, and then put it in the back of the wardrobe. Because old value Daytona was the exact opposite of every other Rolex. It wasn't automatic, it wasn't waterproof, and it didn't have a date. Mm. And most people who got them had already had a Rolex, and they were used to all of those three things. And people got annoyed with Daytonas because they didn't do what they wanted them to do. And the other thing to understand also is that in the 50s and 60s, in the 60s particularly, 
if you wanted a manually wound three dial chronograph with a screw back, mm -hmm. you could buy a bunch of watches from people like Hoya or Nevada or whoever else, which used exactly the same movement mm. um, at half the price of a Daytona. And what everybody forgets about the freaking Daytona is that it is also the least Rolex watch Why that, that Rolex have ever made. Well, because the cases were made by Charles Spielman, mm -hmm. the movements are made by Valjoux, the dials are made by Singer, the hands are made by Universo. The only thing that Rolex made was the crown. <laughs> <laughs> the winding button. <laughs> yeah, right. I love that. What about this whole uh, notion of celebrities wearing watches and I guess maybe ambassadors in general? Do you think that they matter in the in the big picture? What I find interesting is that is that again, this is what one of these areas where Rolex have been ahead of the field for so many years. I mean, they they had ambassadors 40, 50 years ago, mm -hmm. Jack Nicholas, people like that, Dame Kiri Takanawa. Um, one of the things about Rolex is that they've always chosen people who are at the top of their field. A, they're at the top of their field, and B, they are at the top of their field in professions or pastimes mm -hmm. that the that a Rolex owner would either enjoy or would aspire to. Mm. You know, there are no hip hop DJs who are Rolex ambassadors. That's true. Yet there are no tattooists who are Rolex ambassadors. Also true. Roger Federer is a Rolex ambassador. He's not famed for his skateboarding skills. <laughs> well, that's very true. You know, think about it. You know, Dame Terry Carlo what opera. Roger Federer, tennis. The Sydney to Hobart yacht race down here. It's... Yeah. All of these people, all, all of these events and all of these people are aspirational. They're not They're not something that your teenager would respect or would look up to. They're people that your teenager would find boring. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. We'll leave that to Tudor to have the more interesting ambassadors. Yeah. And Tudor, Tudor is... is is the Lockheed Skunk Works of Rolex. And one of the things I, I found really amazing about the relationship between Rolex and Tudor is that in the in the buildings in Geneva, as you would expect, you have key cards to move between offices and what have you. Mm. And everything is controlled by your key card. Rolex and Tudor are in the same big building at Acacia's, mm. the head office. Um, but if you have a Rolex card, it won't get you into the Tudor area and vice versa. Well, I take it seriously, I guess. Yeah. I, 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 I was really impressed with that. Yeah. Okay, so on, on the whole Rolex uh, mystery, I want to know what the biggest myth that you've heard around Rolex is, and I want you to clear it up. When I started collecting, one of the very first watches I bought was a Harwood Automatic. Okay. And I got interested in the story of Harwood which then got me interested in early automatic wristwatches in the, in the 20s and 30s. And I started to collect those and still have quite a collection of them. And one thing I discovered was that the only one that really worked properly was the Rolex bubble bag. And so I decided to, that's what got me interested in Rolex, is trying to discover the history of the company. Because the, the, they made a watch that worked. So I started asking around, the most common myths that I heard was that Rolex was owned by the Catholic, was owned by the Vatican. That's a good one. And w what is bizarre is that Hans Wilsdorf actually wrote an autobiography. Huh. It's, it's a little booklet called The the, uh, the Vadi Meekum. Cool. And the, the opening lines of that book are, I was born to Protestant parents in, in Bavaria. And the subtext for that is Bavaria is the most Catholic state in all of Germany. Northern Germans call Bavaria the northernmost province of Italy. Huh. Um, it, it, it is intensely Catholic. And it, it was, uh, there was a federal law passed maybe 15 years ago, which finally forced every classroom in Bavaria to take a crucifix down from the wall. Every <laughs> classroom had a crucifix on the wall. So that's how Catholic it was. So he was raised as an outcast. Huh. And so the, the idea that he, that he would have sold the company to the Vatican is, is something that amuses me. And that he was buried in the Church of England. Um, he, he was a Protestant all his life. 
So the idea that the company was owned by the Vatican is, uh, and I can understand where it came from because people, you know, they're hidden. Nobody knows anything. It's all behind closed doors. And that's probably the story of, uh, of what people thought about Rolex. And so they put two and two together and made 403.196. Math. Which, which brings us back to the very start. Everyone thinks they know about Rolex. They don't. Okay. Can I, can I say something? Of course. For me, it's very early in the morning, but there are certain rules that I've lived my life by. One of them is this, is that an idiot thinks he knows everything. An expert knows he doesn't know everything. Mm. I am still learning. Yeah, that's a very good rule to live your life by. Yeah, you're clearly a wealth of knowledge, Jane. And I, and I think that's yeah. maybe a, the, the perfect point to say thank you and start wrapping this up because, as you said, it's early in the morning. You've uh, probably, you know, onto your second tea. But it's late in the evening for us, so we don't want to keep you too. Well, thanks, late. gentlemen. It's, it's been fun. I hope that I hope that sooner or later travel will return. And uh, are you going to do Geneva Watch Weeks in August? I would be very surprised if if either of us did Geneva Watch Weeks. But you know, um, yeah. never say never. Are you? <coughs> I, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, is I'm, it worth it? I, I've, I've I've accepted the invite. I'll wait and see who gets back to me with uh, a serious proposal and, and then I'll make a decision. Yeah, I think it's very um, much like that, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, thank you, right. so, thank you so much for your time. There was a whole bunch of stuff that we, we could have talked about, but we didn't. But I, uh, We'll you know, save it for part two. We'll, have to, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we go and we'll, we'll either have to do it in person or catch up with you later somehow. Yeah. Yeah, because I'd like to, uh, at some point, talk about other than Rolex and talk yeah. about modern watchmaking because <laughs> that's really where my focus is now. Well, um, I think I'd definitely like to, we should I'd like queue talk up. about Charles Frodsham and, uh, oh, yes. and various other things. So, yeah. Well, we'll have to get you uh, either um, – I might fl- flick you an email uh, to either get some quick dot points from you later on, but we'll have to do okay. part two. Part two is coming. Part two. We're locking it in. All right. Thank you so much, James. All right. Take care. Bye. Thanks, James. A pleasure. See ya. You know, the intro to this, you said that uh, James Dowling was an authority. I think we just reinforced that. Yeah. Mm. That was, uh, as the kids say, a treat. It was, uh, it was bloody delightful. Really? Yeah. Well, I think we should wrap it up. We, uh, you know, we've got things to do, places yep. to see. Cool. Well, Felix, how do they get in touch if, uh, if the people want to submit a watch matchmaker request? They could email us at otthepodcast at gmail.com. That is our email address. Uh, Thank you to our sponsors and to Majors on Media for producing and supporting the podcast. Make sure you follow us on Instagram at ot.podcast. And thank you to James. Yeah, thank you, James. Thank you. What a gentleman. All right, we'll catch you next time, guys. See you later.